met her in the fall. He took her to a movie, and when they done it all, he took her. To Hello, and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer. This week, we're joined by the Shamdarelli sisters, whose film Armania offers a lighter look at the German-Turkish identity crisis. For the million-plus foreign workers arriving in 1960s Germany, something was lost in translation. No. The sisters' film is a tribute to the pluck and initiative of their ancestors. He didn't really kidnap your grandmother, did he? He did. He did. Oh. Yes. Also on the show, a descendant of the Shaman Kings sounds a note of environmental caution. If you cut a sacred tree, the tree will fall on you. But first, Life in a Day is the inspiring result of an Oscar-winning documentary team who asked thousands of people to send in films about what they did on one day. What do you love? What do you fear? What's in your pocket? These are the questions posed by Oscar-winning director Kevin McDonald to inspire people from all over the world. <laughs> to take part in a feature film crafted solely from homemade clips uploaded to YouTube. It's a film which is trying to um, explore in a serious way what it's like to be alive today, what it was like to be alive on the 24th of July, with all the kind of pain and violence and horror but also love and happiness and hope and expectation that was present in that day, that is present in, in, in every day. I love life. All so much fun. I really love my family. Oh my God! There are antecedents to our film, no doubt, that people have made archive films before. But what's obviously new is we surrendered to uploaders. We surrendered to YouTube users and sort of people sending in camera work with no preconcepts of what they were going to show us. And of course, this is the first time it's, all, it's been done all on one day. Over 81,000 people submitted more than 4,500 hours of footage, all shot on July 24, 2010. There was nothing really set up. There was no narrative ahead of time. It was completely open for people to express whatever they wanted to express. And as a result, I think we got some Amazing shots that you probably wouldn't get out of a professional film crew. Good morning, everyone. I was shooting a Korean guy who travels all around the world by bicycle. Uh, he's doing this already for 10 years. He's been to 192 countries and uh, he really shows you the power everyone has. Uh, the only thing you have to change is the view and uh, then you have the same power as he does. It's uh, not easy to explain motivation, but impossible is a passion. There's these ways of sort of building a sequence as if one thing is happening, but um, through many different clips. A guy in India takes a, a newspaper out of his newspaper basket. He drops it through a letterbox in uh, Italy and a guy in Spain picks it up and a person in Peru opens it and reads it. You could follow it as if it was one story, but it's actually made up of Frankenstein parts. I'm very thankful to uh, the beautiful star. Not be out there again, doing crazy things. Enjoying life. To hear ordinary people express those very basic emotions and ideas is really powerful and, and very direct. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the film overall is that it has this um, honesty about it, this directness about it. We did this for a project, and then it, it became so much more for us, and it's been wonderful. To me, it was like a poem, like a, a, like a cinematic poem, you know, it just, uh, or a song or something. It was, it, it's a movie you have to see more than once, I think, um, to really be able to take it all in. There's just so many, it's a movie about nuances in people, like little things that you 
don't see in scripted movies. These are things you can't capture unless you're just lucky. I'm very fond of every single clip in the film, and they're all, you know, everything, when it's whittled down that much, you know, you know that the selection process, it, it's there because it has to be there, and the whole thing falls apart. The baton is dropped if there's one bad clip. So every clip is serving a purpose, and I love them all like my children, so I wouldn't want to pick. <laughs> A visual treat now with Boo Song about the myths, magic and shamanistic beliefs of the Palawan, the indigenous people of the Philippines' stunning Palawan region. Boo Song is the first indigenous feature film from Palawan the pristine island province of the southern Philippines. Inspired by Palawan myth and legend learned as a child from his mother, and rich with cultural symbolism and poetic beauty, writer-director Orea Silito's Busong is a cautionary tale about the perils of environmental exploitation. What's the meaning of the title of the film, Busong? Busong is um, instant karma. Instantly you get your karma or your faith. It's this magical thing that, uh, that's very Palawan. If you cut a sacred tree, the tree will fall on you. Is yeah. it always to do with nature? Yeah, nature and, and other men. If you're talking about Busong, who's like the, the ultimate? Because we're talking about animists, aren't we? Yeah, like, yeah. Nature. The Palawan is one of the rare monotheistic tribes. Uh, we have a one god called Ampu. He's like the weaver of the universe. And then he has a series of diwatas. Diwata is like spirit, spirit of the forest, spirit of the tree, spirit of the mountain. What um, fascinated me about the film is making these kind of concepts almost accessible to a Western audience who maybe had never thought about these things. Like the nature itself is almost a character, you know. Right, exactly. The main character of Busong is Palawan, the land itself. Man and nature is one. Alessandra de Rossi plays Punai, an embodiment of nature. I was born with wounds in my feet. As the people try to damage the environment, so do my wounds uh, worsen. Clifford Banagali plays a half Palawan emigre returning to the island in search of his roots, who rediscovers his inner potential as a shamanic healer. While the animistic Palawan culture blurs boundaries between nature and man, with its acute detailing of ritual, artifact, and mythology, Busong transcends the border between fiction and anthropological document. You've been raised on storytelling and I suppose many generations of storytelling culture. Do you think that in some way by making films you're kind of continuing this tradition? My mother told me that uh, our chanters chanted is Tultol. Tultols are like epics, epic chants. They would chant it, chant it for a week. And my mother told me, those were our movies, son. We would imagine each chant each night, and we would anticipate the next chapter the next night, and the next night. And I guess cinema is my tultol. As, a, as an ascendant of the Palawan Shaman Kings, I think it's my time to tell our stories through cinema. Before it was word of mouth, now it's through cinema.
Welcome to this fabulous picture show screening of Almanya, which means Germany in Turkish. Can we please welcome the filmmakers here? This is Yasmin and Nisreen Shandarelli. Thank you. It was 10 years in the making, wasn't it? Why did you want to make this film so much? Well, I think um, it's a bit like saying thank you to our grandparents, the movie. Mm. So, of course, it was, um, it came from the bottom of our hearts. <laughs> it just sounds cheesy, it is, yes. So. Nisreen? Most of the, the movies made in Germany about uh, immigrants or Turkish immigrants were always ending in drama. And we had the feeling that we, we should make a, a comedy about it. The Shandarelli sisters' comedy spans 45 years. It takes us back to the 60s, soon after West Germany opened its doors to foreign laborers. The film tells the story of guest worker number one million and one, Hussein Yilmaz, and the lives of his extended family, <laughs> including third generation Jane, who's in the throes of an identity crisis. The film launches into an odyssey Endlich da. as the three generations travel to Anatolia to rediscover their heritage. It took 14 years for the Turkish German sisters to finish the screenplay. What, what our grandparents and our parents told us was a lot of quite funny things. And we thought, that's interesting. Nobody remembers that. Nobody remembers that the beginnings weren't so hard. Yeah, there were no, no negativity, also between the Germans and the Turkish and other nationalities. Ich hätte gerne ein Brot. Brot. Brot halt. Just wanted to make a really uh, subjective movie and tell things <sighs> um, that uh, commonly weren't really known in Germany. The film's release coincides with real-life concerns about European immigration. This multicultural approach, saying that we simply live side by side and are happy about each other, this approach has failed, utterly failed. And it's just this mindset that the Chanderellis are trying to subvert. We definitely think that laughing with each other is, is, is a good base for everything. It's good to take things not too serious and just to see humans as a human and family as a family because families, I think, are almost all over the world the same. They are always trouble, they, 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 they are always weird characters and, and you have to deal with them and, and, and they're good fun. <laughs> Besides giving me a, a belly full of giggles, what were you hoping the audiences would, would walk away with? Just to make them feel really foreign somewhere and to have this experience of being really um, in a place where you don't speak the language. So the drag. I think it's, it's quite uh, important to have that experience. When we wrote the script, and of course it's mainly done for a German audience, then when we decided the Turkish would speak all fluently German, <laughs> and the Germans would speak, of course, a foreign language nobody understands, gibberish. Yes. Uh, and a lot of audience would come and say, that was really nice to just have their perspective, just to, to feel how they would feel. Is you all know it was gibberish? You, you notice? <laughs> but it's really funny, a lot of even German audience, they, they, they are really like confused. Like at the beginning, they go, do, you, do they really speak such a weird accent where you are from? Haben Sie Milch? Milch, Milch. No. Yeah. I'm Turkish and I was born in London, but my family left Cyprus in 68. So a lot of the stories in the film, I was laughing out loud because they, they, they resonate with me. What was a mirror to your life? Uh, sleeping, the, the brothers sharing a bed. Da sollen wir zu dritt drin schlafen? Ich schlaf doch nicht in einem Bett mit dem da. 
and also for me um not knowing am i turkish am i english you know my turkish is awful i remember going to turkey and trying to speak turkish and being told that i spoke donkey turkish yeah. <laughs> What is your identity? Do tell us. Tell us what you are. It's really difficult to just say, okay, I'm one or I'm this or that. I mean, I just accepted it and I say, yeah, it's, it's me, it's Nesrin, and I am born in Germany and I, I'm German, but I have Turkish origin, so... Sometimes you feel a bit more Turkish and sometimes you feel a bit more German or sometimes you feel English, so um, it helped just to, yeah, to just to relax about it and say, it's all good, you know, being mixed is fine. Wie heißt das schöne Land, wo dein Vater herkommt? Äh, Anatolien. Oh, das ist leider nur eine Europakarte, die... Wir können das Fähnchen hier hinsetzen, ja? In recent years, many people have been scared to make jokes about their religion or cultural differences. In many ways, I was very interested to see you, you know, try and, and, and reclaim comedy almost as a genre. But it has been a bit of a no-go area. Would you agree or not? Definitely, but we were in the um, luckier position because, you know, we are showing our perspectives, it's, which was, of course, seeing the German culture, like, from, from outside. My brother told me that the Germans eat human flesh and people. It's a sign of a dead man on the cross. Und haben sie auch oft gegessen. Und jeden Sonntag treffen sie sich in einer Kirche und essen von ihm und trinken sein Blut. Echt? Die essen Menschen? Mhm. The question would be, how would, you know, if we would have done the same with uh, Islam, for example, then, you know, yeah, it would have been maybe a big issue. Is there anybody here that's uncomfortable to ask? I mean, did, were there some things that anyone thought might have been a little offensive? The scene with the boy having the nightmare about the... Jesus trying to eat him. If I was reading that script, I'd be like, whoa, would I want to be involved in that? That's true. But it didn't come across that way at all. It didn't offend, and I, I hope no one was offended by it. But you are very cheeky and subversive at times. When you show that to become a German, you have to eat pork and go on holidays to Mallorca. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the transformation of obviously his wife. Why do you two get away with it, do you think? Because it's true, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a nightmare. So I guess people, of course, see the point. It's not man deadly serious. So it is a way of, you know, pointing out little tiny things where you can laugh about. But of course, if you put it into a dream, then people understand. I really loved the way that you told the story often through childlike eyes. When we look back nostalgically, when you, when you hear about your grandparents' story, you treated it obviously, I, I felt like I was going into a dream world of fantasy where kidnapping your grandmother is a perfectly fine thing. Tell us about that, because he didn't really kidnap your grandmother, did he? He did. He did. Oh. Yes. That's not very yeah. funny. <laughs> but that was like the most normal thing in these days, and still is, you know, in some parts. But she was agreeable to being kidnapped in some way. Or well, she the had funny thing not is... Not really, I think. No, she no. told us, yeah. She, she, was, like, she was like, She oh, was not sure. Wow. She wasn't sure if she wanted him really uh, to marry him, but... Um, she had no choice then. And in those days, really, it was a matter if they were alone for a few hours. So what had happened, that it was basically then that girl could not marry anybody else because everyone would be thinking, oh, she might be not a virgin anymore. <laughs> How autobiographical is this? How much do we get a diary into your lives? Yeah, little things like um, the Christmas scene. Oh, no! Wir dürfen die Geschenke doch vorher nicht sehen. Die sind ja gar nicht verpackt. Ja, dann macht eure Augen eben zu. And your mother really brought out the presents unwrapped. And yeah, she had no clue, so... And she was really quite upset that she couldn't fulfill your Christmassy notion. She got, she got like, all, oh, come on, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just do it somehow. And we're like, no, you have to do it the right way. The tree has to look like this <laughs> and this. She was like, oh, goodness. 
You two were nightmares, weren't you? <laughs> das kann doch gar nicht sein. Ich bin doch die Pille jeden Morgen. Scheiße, Mann, David, was hast du nur gemacht? Was ich? Was hast du nur für ein komisches Sperma? Can I pick on your boyfriend for a minute? Yes, yeah, sure. So you have definitely been part of this journey, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, Unless you're a new boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I've been part of it for a, yeah, the last four and a half years, so it's been a big Isn't part of my Isn't that funny? You started, so when did the English boyfriend character come into the film? About four and a half years yeah, ago. When he came into the film. <laughs> you wrote your way into the <laughs> script. Baba, so what do you mean? I'm just going to go. <laughs> I have been never pregnant. I always say that at this point because once I say I have an English boyfriend, everyone's like, oh. I'm like, no, I've never been pregnant. <laughs> it's like, no, thank God for me. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't be alive now if, if she had, I don't think. <laughs> thank you for making us laugh, ladies, this afternoon. Everybody, can we please thank here? This is Yasmin and Nizreen. Thank, thank you very for coming. Much. Was there something fishy about the death of Princess Diana and her lover Dodie fired in that Paris tunnel? British actor and bon vivant Keith Allen thinks there was. When the woman left a note saying, FYI, if I'm dead, here's how it's gonna happen, and then it happens exactly like that, I think someone should pay attention. His documentary, Unlawful Killing, presents a smattering of familiar theories. Diana was certain that her phones were being tapped by the British Secret Services. Every time she'd hear a click, he used to say, boys, time to change the tape. It suggests the establishment wanted Diana out of the way and that the media turned a blind eye, especially during the 2007 inquest into the deaths. There were arguments, lies, tears and accusations. Yet before the court case had even begun, the media had already decided what the verdict should be. I had always suspected that we had never really got to the bottom of how they died anyway. Um, and I, I, wanted to, I wanted to watch this case unravel. The film revisits some perennially unanswered questions. What you are seeing is what the CCTV camera at the entrance to the armor tunnel was recording at the time of the crash. Nothing. Because it was switched off. And the supposed motives for killing her. Barry. One down. One down. One down. One I believe that Diana was killed by the arms industry. Richard Wiseman and Keith Allen. Thank you very much indeed. At this year's Cannes Film Festival, Allen faced a room full of skeptics. It does nothing, Keith. Nothing new at all. And wasn't Richard. helped by the revelation that the film had been bankrolled by Dodie's father, the wealthy and controversial businessman Mohammed Fayed. I'm wondering why you did not indicate your relationship with Mr. Fayed in the film. I think you'll find that there are an immense number of films coming out of America and all over the world that are financed by the Mafia, and there's no reference to those. So. Yeah. <laughs> but was the hostile reaction to Alan's film all part of an entrenched media position? I was expecting worse, to be honest. That is a public arena and it's live. Once they get back into their hotel rooms, you know, hoo -hoo -hoo, I can't wait to see what they write tomorrow. <laughs> to be ten times worse than that. If you were ever going to do something dodgy to Diana, that's the time you would do it. She'd become trouble, as she used to say to me. I'm trouble to them. I won't go away. I won't go quietly. That's it for this fabulous picture show, and the girls are going to say goodbye in Donkey Turkish. Hoşça kalın. That was quite good. That wasn't Donkey Turkish. Donkey Turkish, too long. Bye. Choose in German. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate this film? 8. 6, 7. Strong 8, definitely. I loved it. I thought it was a very sort of warm-hearted film. I think it's quite interesting now, especially then, because there's this discussion in Germany about uh, foreigners. Really funny, really distinctive characters, um, and just a great laugh, yeah.